All right, so uh, now we've got some space here, and uh, what we're going to do is to, uh, to obtain a characterization theorem for linear functions between finite dimensional vector spaces, essentially between Euclidean spaces. So uh, let's write this down as a theorem. And so we'll say that um, a function between Euclidean spaces is linear or a linear function a pure linear function, as I said I would try to say most of the time, uh, if and only if, that's actually an important part of this, because it's critical if this is going to be a characterization theorem, if and only if there is a unique M by N matrix A such that for all X in the domain, all vectors in the domain, F of X equals A times X. So in other words, sort of putting this into words a little bit, we say linear functions between Euclidean spaces are exactly the functions that we saw at the outset when we first defined, we first said we have a matrix and we defined our function this way and then we showed in effect that it was a linear function because we showed that it would satisfy L1, the function would satisfy L1 and L2. And what this says effectively is not only does it go that way, it goes the other way, and the matrix is unique. That is, if the function is linear, then it has to be that kind of a function. And there's a specific matrix that gives us that function. So let's uh, see about proving this. Well, let's start by... Uh, noting that this actually could have been written much more succinctly as there exists an M by N matrix and there exists a unique M by N matrix is where we put the exclamation point after the existence symbol. Uh, so this is just to point out that we may need that to write it in the, in the proof and we can write it a little more concisely. And I'm going to write the whole, uh, the whole, uh, this whole condition. I'm going to call this, well, I don't want to call it star because I already used that, so I'll call it double star. So in our remark, we said that a function is a linear function if and only if it satisfies the condition star that we wrote there. Now we're saying uh, a function is a linear function if and only if it satisfies this other condition that we're calling double star. Although in their remark we were in arbitrary vector spaces and for the theorem we're talking about Euclidean spaces. So let's see now if we can prove it. We have to go both ways because if and only if. Let's um, Let's note that, of course, we have the double star condition implies L1 and L2 because that's what we already did. It, this double star condition says we have a matrix and then we have a function defined in terms of the matrix uh, multiplied by vector. And that's exactly what we had at the outset and we showed that we got L1 and L2. So 
we already did this. We don't have to prove it again. And so the key is to go the other way. So we need to show that L1 and L2 imply double star. So let's start by doing the following. So what we're going to do here is something that uh, is a useful idea. It's kind of powerful for linear functions. And uh, it's something that uh, we will see again. Um, and let me actually carry it out a little bit first, and then I'll say a little more about this, this idea, this technique, or this approach. So we're going to say, uh, for each of the unit vectors in the domain Rn, so for each unit vector for which I think I have used, and here I'm going to use actually subscript J, for each unit vector Ej, and I guess we could put over here, J equals 1 to n, so it's each unit vector in the domain. Now remember, the unit vector, E sub 1, the first unit vector is just the vector 1, 0, 0, all zeros in Rn. E2 is the unit vector in Rn that has 0 and then a 1 in the second component and all zeros and so on. So the unit vectors are the vectors that have a 1 in one of the components and 0 everywhere else. So for each of the unit vectors, let Aj be our notation for f of Ej. Again, j equals 1 to n. So what's going on here? Let's actually uh, draw a little picture of what, what's going on here. So let's suppose that n is uh, 2 and m is 3. So let's go over here and let's say uh, n is 2, m is 3 for our little diagram, and let's draw our axes in blue here. So here we have, probably should have made it farther to the left to give myself a little more space, and here I have the target space, is and here I have x1 and x2. Uh, actually, I could have written this as y1, y2, and y3, I suppose, because we're used to thinking of f taking functions taking x vectors to y vectors. But this is actually okay. So, and so now let's uh, say that f is going from r2. R3, and so let's say this is E1, which is 1, 0, and this is E2, which is 0, 1, and let's suppose those get mapped to, and let me put them in a different color over here. So let's suppose that E1, F takes, actually let's note that this is F here, so f, let's say f takes um, e1 to this vector over here in R3. And then for this, let me even write little arrows out here. So this, let's say, is a1 because that's f of e1. And let's suppose that this over here is A2, which is f of E2. So that's all that's going on here is that we have uh, each of our unit vectors in the domain, and in this case when the domain is R2, we have two unit vectors, and our function, of course, maps any vector in R2 to a vector over here, and we're looking at just what f does to the unit vectors and not worrying about what it does to any of the other vectors. That's the kind of technique 
that I was alluding to here that turns out to be useful in lots of situations with linear functions especially. So we look at just what happens under f to the two unit vectors here and we get mapped to some arbitrary two vectors over here that I'm just naming a1 and a2 and more generally a1 to an over in the target space. So again we should emphasize that these are in the target space Rm and of course the E's so that's true of both sides of the equation of course that's true of this too uh, so uh, so let's go back to where we are now in the in the proof so then we have what we have f of x let's say for any x in the domain we have f of x well what's x x can be written just in terms of the unit vectors that's an additional part of this kind of technique i'm describing so x is actually a linear combination of unit vectors i think we may have actually pointed that out a little earlier when we were talking about linear combinations and and maybe about a basis um, so here we have we can rewrite x as x1 the first component of x a number times e1 plus the second component of x times the unit the second unit vector out to the last component of x times the last uh, unit vector so this vector here is just the vector with an x1, the number x1 in the first component, everything else is zero. This vector is the vector with x2 in the second component, all the other components zero. xn, the number xn in the nth component, all the previous components zero, and then we add them together. But this is just a linear combination of the vectors e1 to en that are in the domain. So our remark tells us that, whoop, <laughs> let's uh, not get ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> let's, the remark tells us that this would be equal to x1 f of e1 plus x2 f of e2 plus all the way out to xn f of e n. So this is just exactly applying a remark where the x's, the numbers, the x's are components of the vector x, but they're in themselves just numbers, real numbers. And so the x's here, those numbers are playing the role of the alphas in our remark. And the e's, the unit vectors, are playing the role of the v vectors in the domain in our remark. And so the image of a linear combination is that same linear combination of the images. That's how we describe this. And of course, then these are all a1 to a n. So this is uh, x1, a1, x2, a2, out to x n, a n. Each of the a's is a vector in r m. Each of the x's is just a number. So if we think of these a's as column vectors that have m elements in the column vector, this is just a linear combination of a bunch of column m vectors. That is, this could be rewritten as the matrix A times the vector x where a is uh, the m by n matrix whose columns are a1 out to a n. n columns m um, uh, and each of these has m elements in it. 
So there are M rows now in our matrix because each one of these A vectors is in RM. So if I think it was a column vector, it has M components, M elements in, the, in that column. So this is an M by N matrix. And uh, AX is exactly this linear combination of those column vectors. And so we actually have proved that we can, for a linear function, an arbitrary linear function, we can use this technique of seeing what happens to the unit vectors under F. We can use that technique to actually define a matrix, define the columns of a matrix, and therefore define a matrix for which F of X is A times X for every element of the domain. So we've actually finished the proof except for one thing, and that one thing that we haven't done is we haven't shown that the matrix uh, A is unique, and so let's see if we can just squeeze that in down here at the bottom. Let's say to show the matrix is unique, Let's suppose f of x is ax, but suppose it's also bx for some other matrix, b. So I've got f of x equal to a matrix times x, but not necessarily unique. So this says maybe it's not unique. Maybe there's another matrix, b, that does the same thing. But then what do we have? Then we have, uh, since, since AX equals BX, let's just focus on this part, forget about the F of X part. Since AX equals BX, then I actually have A minus B. I can take the BX to the left and have AX minus BX, or A minus B times X. And that's the zero vector then, because I've taken this over to here. So I have this is the zero vector. And so what I need to do, and I didn't actually write this. I need, to, I need to suppose that this is true for every x in the domain. Because if, let's say this is the zero vector here. If this matrix times x is the zero vector, that doesn't guarantee that the matrix is all zeros, of course, because uh, the, even if this weren't all zeros, there would be some x's that solve this system of homogeneous linear equations. Um, but if this is the case for every possible x in the domain, then that could only happen if this is the zero matrix. To put it perhaps another way, the uh, here we're saying, if this is true for every x in the domain, then that says that every x in the domain is a solution of this uh, system of homogeneous linear equations. And the only way that can be true is if the set of solutions is the entire domain, all of our n. So I'm just saying the same thing in a couple of different ways. So here we have, therefore, a equals B, and that completes the proof. We have shown that if f of x equals a times x, but also equals b times x, well, a and b are really the same matrix. They're not two different matrices. So we do get a unique matrix here. And so now we have a characterization theorem for linear functions between finite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, this is going to be extremely valuable. This is going to be, the, in a sense, the foundation of a lot of what we're going to do in the course, especially when we start talking shortly about derivatives. Uh, in particular, derivatives for functions from Rn to R and from Rn to Rm. The fact that um, linear functions give us uh, can be expressed in terms of a matrix is going to be central to what we do. So I've said that the, this theorem is 
uh, kind of central to what we're going to be doing uh, in a lot of the course. That it's kind of the foundation for some a lot of what we'll do, especially when we start talking about derivatives. And that reminds me that uh, we have this uh, quote here from Simon and Bloom. Now, this is, it says down at the bottom, paraphrasing Simon and Bloom, so it's not, I guess, a direct quote. I don't recall but I, that it, which words I changed to, to make it a little more obvious or simplified. But uh, it's basically pretty much word for word uh, what you'll see in Simon and Bloom. And so, uh, and I think this is, a, uh, this is a passage in Simon and Bloom that I really like. I think this is really uh, to the point. And that is that what we've shown is that every linear function is defined by or can be defined by an M by N matrix. And as they say, it's a fundamentally important fact. And the important part of that fact is, I think, more this point here, that if it's linear, then there will be a matrix that characterizes or defines the function. And so, as I say, a matrix is not just a rectangular array of numbers, as we usually think of it. But in fact, a matrix is a linear function, and vice versa. A linear function, basically, is an M by N matrix. And so they're really different facets of the same thing or the same idea. And that is going to be important in calculus, the derivative of a function, which is typically nonlinear, say capital F. The derivative of a nonlinear function is, in a certain well-defined sense, the best linear approximation of the nonlinear function at a given point in the domain. And then we move to other points, we get different linear approximations. So in other words, the derivative, if it's a linear approximation or a linear function, then that says the derivative is really just nothing but an M by N matrix. And in fact, we can even say that suppose that M is 1. So we're going from Rn into the reals, then the derivative would be a 1 by n matrix. That is, it'd be, think of it as a row vector with n components, a component for each element of, uh, of Rn. Um, uh, not a component for each element of Rn, a component uh, for, each, for each integer from 1 to n. It would be n components. And so, of course, that derivative is going to be the thing that we call the gradient of f, and that's going to have n components. It's going to have a first component, which is going to be, so we're jumping ahead a little bit here, out to an nth component, which is going to be this. The, each of these will be a number, if this is being evaluated at a given, say, x bar. Each of these will be a number, so each of these will be in r, so that this will be in Rn. So the derivative, or as we usually call it the gradient of a function from Rn to R1, will be characterized by a 1 by n row vector, single row matrix, and that's the matrix, the matrix consisting of the partial derivatives of the function. And so that's a little bit of a preview of how this result, this idea, is going to be, in fact, central to what we'll do as we move forward in the course. So now let's take this off and we will uh, do some examples.